crash. Like, trust me, we don't want to crash. Assets are replaceable, human, human life isn't. You love it so much, and you can forget that the airplane doesn't really care about you. Matt Hall Racing business is my entire life, so. Um, do you use that term, tiger country? Not so much, no. We use, we use that in Australia, with <laughs> tiger country, it's where the tigers live. I think the biggest thing is, is mindset. Hi guys, it's Matt here from Sling Pilot Academy. We're really excited this week to welcome Matt Hall, uh, Australian aerobatic champion and uh, Red Bull air race pilot and uh, airplane aficionado uh, to our academy. Matt was uh, flying at the Pacific Air Show, uh, barring our friend Rob Holland's airplane for the air show um, while he was here away from Australia. And we had an opportunity to catch up with Matt and get his take on aviation safety and uh, being an excellent pilot. Enjoy. Hi everyone, we're very uh, happy to welcome Matt Hall here. Uh, Matt is from uh, Australia and he's a very accomplished pilot. Matt, welcome to California. Thank you, it's great to be here. Awesome uh, to be here actually. Oh, that's great. And what brings you all the way uh, across the ocean to California? Um, this time I was lying in the, uh, the Huntington Beach uh, Air Show, the Pacific Air Show. The reason for that is that uh, the Pacific Air Show is uh, going international next year and they're going to the Gold Coast in Australia. So uh, they've brought me over here to to sort of like wave the Australian flag and then have that uh, cross, uh, cross Pacific uh, experience. Oh, that's great. Uh, we see that you're flying uh, um, our friend Rob Holland's airplane. Uh, is it uh, similar to the airplane that you fly back home? Yeah, I've got, a, uh, I've got a number of planes back home. One of them's an MXS, so the single seat um, version of, of this plane. My, my aircraft is set up for racing. Uh, we've kept it set up for racing because it's unique in that regard. So um, this plane actually is a better roll rate than my aircraft. My aircraft's a bit faster. So it's, uh, it's just a, a little bit of uh, you know, um, adapting to the aircraft, but overall they still fly the same and, uh, and you have just as much fun. Oh, that's great. Does this sound okay, Matt? You, you can't hear it, right? Okay. So your MX back home is, is set up for racing. Um, that was uh, for the Red Bull Air Races specifically, correct? That's correct, yeah. So I raced, uh, you know, I've got uh, two race planes. Um, I raced the MXS uh, from 2010 through to 2000, end of 2016. And, and it's reasonably highly modified. Uh, you know, it's got winglets, it's, um, you know, it's got uh, basically everything's tightened down with plenums and cowls. It overheats unless it's going fast sort of thing. Um, and then I've also got an Edge 540 um, V3 um, for racing as well. Once again, it's not much good for anything apart from racing because uh, the visibility is awful because the canopy is so small <laughs> and uh, yeah, you cook the oil and uh, the cylinders unless you're going fast. <laughs> what goes into selecting the Red Bull Air Race pilots uh, during Red Bull? Because obviously all of you are absolutely at the top of your games. Yeah, so it, it's changed over the years about what they look for. Uh, when I got into it, it was pretty early on in, uh, in Red Bull Air Race. It was only a couple of years old. And um, to, to just sort of keep, you know, because they were getting heaps and heaps of applications as you could imagine. So to keep it um, like selective, what they would say is you had to be a, an unlimited uh, aerobatic pilot at uh, competing in the world championships and finishing in the top half of the, of the field. So that sort of whittled it down to, you know, really 25 people worldwide. Um, that could, could get into the, the series. Um, they actually approached me because they were looking for an Australian. Um, uh, I wasn't competing at that level in aerobatics to, at the time. So they said, hey, uh, you need to go and compete um, to get that qualification and then you can come and try racing with me. Since then, they've also realized there's a whole heap of other ways that you can uh, distinguish um, a good pilot. You, you don't have to be an aerobatic pilot anymore. You have to be, you know, demonstrate you can fly these planes very well but they, they take people out of the military, they take people out of airlines, they take uh, people out of uh, ag flying because you can be a, you know, the top of your game in any of those industries and be just as good a pilot. But it's, it's figuring out how you measure them, that those, uh, those items to, to have the correct mindset, the correct attitude, so you don't kill yourself doing it, uh, but also great, great hands and feet to be able to fly these aircraft on the edge by feel. Yeah, so a question you probably get asked, asked a lot, um, there was a very spectacular, uh, a very spectacular video of you touching the water um, during one of the Red Bull uh, air races. Twelve years later, have you had time to reflect on that? Yeah, I started reflecting on that incident about half a second after it happened, and, uh, and uh, for the last twelve years, I actually use it as a training item. Um, you know, you've got to be able to embrace your mistakes and share them, and um, and uh, and work through them. So that's exactly what we did. We we looked at everything that led up to the incident. You know, it's not. It's not, generally incidents aren't caused by one thing. We did a massive debrief and looked at it 
Um, yeah, there was problems with the aircraft, there were problems with my, uh, my, my physical health at the time, there were problems with my mental health at the time of uh, being in the correct attitude to fly the plane. And um, so when we, we broke it all down um, and we removed all those threats, we went out uh, with serviceable aircraft at the very next race and uh, got a podium um, uh, by correcting all the little bits and pieces that led to an incident. And this is, uh, I mean, that's a commendable attitude. Of course, uh, all of us as pilots uh, like to uh, continually uh, assess ourselves and uh, our risk management and uh, our attitude towards safety. So obviously when, you, when you're flying uh, in, in the Red Bull Air Races, you, you're pushing the envelope, you're pushing your own personal boundaries and you're, you're accepting some additional risk. Exactly, so you know, aviation's all about trying to, trying to reduce the risks as much as possible. And you reduce risks by um, increasing margin. That, that's basically, you know what the threat is and you put, you put margin in, in there so that when something does go wrong, you've got margin until it's catastrophic. So yeah, something's happened, I've now got time or altitude or fuel, and that's your margin to solve the problem before something catastrophic happens. When we're racing, we are knowingly re removing the margin. We fly low, so there's not a lot of altitude below us. We fly with uh, you know, not a lot of fuel because you know these planes can't carry a lot of fuel when, when you're pulling those, those amounts. We're pulling a lot of G at the stall and uh, you know, we're going up to 12G uh, in these aircraft. So, uh, and we're, we're flying under bridges and, uh, and around pylons. So we are deliberately flying uh, right up to the limits, um, but we're accepting the risk. But we mitigate some of that by uh, great safety procedures. So you know, we, have, uh, we have onboard oxy systems when we're racing over water and flotation devices. We have guys on jet skis that are the same guys at every race who are trained to come and get us within 30 seconds if we end up in the water. So, it's one of those things, um, you don't go out and low fly and, and do what we do without the proper training and safety support network around you. And you know, I don't go and, and try racing or anything like that without that environment around me. Yeah, so what you're saying is um, you, you're, you're flying at the highest level, you're mitigating risk, uh, there's still no way to, to eliminate the risk even at that level. E exactly, there's no way to eliminate it. And um, you know, I guess it's kind of like car racing as well. You know, no one, no one drives on the road every day expecting to have a car crash. But racing car drivers go into a go into race day expecting that they might crash. Yeah. And it's one of those things we, we don't want to crash. Uh, our planes when we're racing definitely don't want to crash. Like trust me, we don't want to crash. But we are accepting that if something does go wrong, we may have to ditch the aircraft uh, in a very rapid circumstance. Uh, or like what happened to me, things go horribly wrong and all of a sudden you're, you're struggling to not, not uh, write the aircraft off. Uh, but we get up every morning knowing that that is a higher risk for our environment rather than you know, getting, getting in your, your sling and doing some, uh, some flying training where the risk should be as close to zero as you can make it every single day. Yeah, exactly. For example, um, our safety procedures uh, have us flying within gliding distance of a, a safe landing area at all times as much as possible. And obviously there's some times where that margin goes away. For example, uh, uh, we have Catalina Island here and uh, it's, it's great to get a Catalina Island hamburger. Um, if you fly high enough, you can remain within gliding distance of, of either side uh, of land. But um, if you're unable to get that high, there, there may be a few minutes in the middle where if you lose the engine, you, you are in the water. If you uh, uh, were faced with uh, losing the engine over water and um, you had a fixed gear aircraft, and you had a, a parachute, either a, a body parachute or, or a whole airframe parachute, would you, would you ditch or would you try to use the parachute? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, um, and I think it's a personal choice. Yeah, if, if, if you're going to ditch an aircraft, it's, the aircraft's written off, and uh, we've always got to remember that assets are replaceable, human, human life isn't, so always be prepared to write the aircraft off to save yourself is, uh, is, is the key there. So um, you know, it might sound selfish to say it, but it's, it's, the, it's the reason we have um, parachutes, and, and uh, airframe parachutes, it's so that we can write the airframe off to save the souls on board. For me personally, um, I'm not a skydiver. Uh, I do fly with a parachute all the time in these planes, uh, but I'm not a skydiver, um, but I've got a lot of time flying planes. I would always back my, my piloting skills as opposed to my skydiving skills. I've done a lot of underwater escape training uh, with the air race. We, we did annual underwater escape training in these aircraft. So, you know, I know, you know, I'm reasonably familiar with what's going to happen if I you know, put one of these aircraft in the water. It's, you know, you, you're going to get it as slow as possible and as you touch down, it's probably going to, to flip onto its back with, because of the landing gear. Um, so it's just basically a matter of like, as, as, as you touch down, 
big heap, big breath, and then you've got to be prepared to wait for at least 30 seconds until you can open a hatch because of the, uh, the equalization. So if you know all these things, then you know, you know the way to get out, which is, you know, anchor yourself with one hand while you undo the straps. First of all, like I say, you've got to get the canopy open and then undo the straps. And the reason you hold this on is because you're upside down, it might be disorienting. You know that if I hang onto the throttle, that's the way out as well. So it's just, it's just knowing your procedures. And as I say, I'm a, as a pilot, I'd, uh, I'd go for that option myself rather than uh, jumping out and going, oh, oh, how do you do this skydiving thing? <laughs> uh, as pilots, we should uh, uh, prepare ourselves mentally and go through these processes in our minds and in our training and in our practice so that when something occurs, uh, we're not thinking about it for the first time. We should be ready to make a decision um, to either bail or to ditch or to pull the parachute in the scenario that we're in. Me, for example, I would pull the parachute on a whole airframe parachute if I was over the water um, and I, there were no other options. And I've gone through that in my, in my mind many times and I, I know that that's what I would do and I wouldn't question myself. I also like what you say about uh, the airplane being an asset. When people, maybe not so much with flight school airplanes, but when you own a personal airplane that you've put your heart and soul and all of your savings into, you love it so much. And um, you can forget that the airplane doesn't really care about you. I think an interesting thing from my military background is, uh, you know, historically, people don't have a second thought on either bailing out or ejecting in combat situations because they go there expecting losses. And you don't get up in, uh, in peacetime expecting you're going to eject out of a fighter. So they stick with the fighter too long, uh, trying to save the day. Whereas in combat, they go, hey, I'm, there's something wrong with it throw it away, walk back to the field, get a new jet and go again. Do you fly air shows uh, for, for a living or do you have a day job? No, the Matt Hall Racing business is, uh, is my, entire, my entire life. So um, I fly air shows you know, around the world. Obviously the, the plan was to be racing and hopefully we get back racing again in the not too distant future. But uh, otherwise I'm, I'm flying air shows around the world. Um, I do a lot of corporate speaking and motivation speaking in both the aviation industry, but also in risk management, in, uh, in mines, in finance and all those sorts of things about how to, how to be in a high threat environment, but turn it into a very safe environment by, by having the correct mindset and processes in place. You know, we own an airfield that we run. I've got a, a charter company that we're, uh, you know, we do charter with, and you know, we've got a, an experience company. We've got an extra 300L and a two seat P51 Mustang that we, uh, we do experiences in. So yeah, when I rattle it all off like that, I, I actually wonder where do I find the time? And uh, it's actually a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, your background is, is flying, uh, flying fighter jets uh, for, the, for the Air Force? Correct, yeah, I, I joined the Air Force as a teenager back in Australia and I uh, went straight on to, I didn't actually go through the academy, so I was, I was flying as a teenager uh, in the Air Force and um, went straight on to the F-18 Hornet and then um, spent uh, 10 years doing that. I'll just wait for this uh, Bonanza to, uh, to uh, drag itself into the air. Love sitting on an airfield, it's just so nice sitting here watching these planes. It's, uh, yeah, so I uh, flew Hornets for about 10 years and then I uh, was fortunate to be selected to go on an exchange program here in America, in North Carolina actually, and uh, flew the F-15E Strike Eagle for three years. Made a huge amount of new friends and new experiences and ended up back in Australia flying Hornets again and, uh, until I got out after an 18, 18 years straight of flying uh, in the Air Force. Flying at the, at the level that you do, would it ever be advisable for a, a, a regular non-airshow pilot to fly low uh, over the water or low over terrain? Uh, no, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it, while it's tempting, uh, as we were talking about margin and risk, it's, uh, un unless you've been trained formally to do it, it's, um, it's, it can be extremely dangerous. Uh, you know, there, there's issues with water flying is that, uh, you know, non-reflective, so reflective or smooth water, you'll, you, you don't know that how high you are. And many people have just flown, it's called, you know, see if it controlled flight into terrain. Just happens to be water because you can't see where the water is. Uh, doing low level turns, um, you know, people will often get themselves out of balance doing a low level turn because they're worried about, you know, flying, you know, putting the wing down and they'll, they'll end up slow and, uh, and spin in. Um, you can end up not having the performance that if you are low flying and you come, you're up, you're flying uh, up, up some rising terrain, but you're not aware of it because everything's flat around you. Once again, you're running out of airspeed and you've got no options. Um, so it's it's definitely something you need to be formally trained in for uh, for low flying operations, and it's a great thing to do. It's fun. You know, I really enjoy my low flying, um, but it has to be in a controlled environment with the correct mentality, with the correct training. Uh, so if you are interested in doing it go ahead and do it, but do it via getting your ratings correctly and being in the correct environment, uh, a sanitized area, know where all the wires are, you know your low flying area and do it for a purpose, 
not just to go out and have fun. That's great. Do you feel Go safe? Or oh. Like something happened and no one's not working out. Oh, no worries. Mine's working all right, is it? Yep. Oh, that's right. I've, I've, got, I've got all the time in the world, so. What do you consider to be less risky? If you were flying over the water or over the Amazon jungle, which would you think is less risky? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard one. Uh, I think I'd always rather go into water because I've got you know, reasonable uh, swimming skills and, and uh, exit skills from an aircraft in the water. Um, and because I'm flying with a parachute, your parachute's actually a flotation device for the first uh, half hour or so until it becomes waterlogged. In a jungle, you are gonna, it's going to hurt. Uh, going into trees, uh, yes, you know, the, the tops of the trees may not hurt so much, but at some stage, the tops of trees are connected to the bottoms of the trees, which is the tree trunks, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt when you hit tree trunks. Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, yeah, being over water is a more survivable uh, option if things go wrong. That's great. I think some people just uh, feel a, a false sense of security over water as if it's, uh, it's going to be a nice soft little cushion, uh, but probably not that good. No, it's not going to be that good. And um, yeah, as I say, you know, if, the, the safest place to be you know, is over flat terrain. That you know, I'd always back myself um, to, to put the aircraft down. Uh, but if I am over tiger country, um, do you use that term tiger country? Not so much, no. We use, we use that in Australia, we <laughs> tiger country is where the tigers live, <laughs> uh, in the jungle. So if we're over tiger country, that's where I'd use my parachute, whereas over water, I'd, I'd ditch the aircraft. And um, it, it's funny, you know, people will look at what I do and they'll say, wow, that's, that's high risk what you're doing. Uh, what if you have an engine failure? But in my show, I'm going very fast at low level. If I have an engine failure at low level, I'm, I can climb up to about 2,000 feet and then do a glide circuit and land wherever I want. If it's over, over an airfield, I'll land on the airfield, I'll find a road, or I'll ditch in the, uh, in the water if that's where the display is. But I'll watch people, they'll tell me what I do is risky, because what if I have an engine failure? But then I'll watch them go and fly over tiger country in a single engine Cessna with no parachute or anything like that. And uh, for half an hour, they will die if they have an engine failure. Whereas I'm not gonna die with an engine failure. So it's, it's the perspective, you've got to make sure you continue with the perspective that um, you know, what will happen. And yes, I might, I might write the aircraft off, but I will survive if I have an engine failure during my display. But if, if you have an engine failure over tiger country, you are most likely going to die if you're not within gliding range or have a parachute. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. You've obviously excelled in so many forms of aviation. Some advice for our students, what does it take to be an excellent pilot? I think the biggest thing is, is mindset both being safe but excelling in in your chosen um, path of aviation so uh, with all the fighter training I've done I've you know, trained a lot of fighter pilots and I always say we want confidence not arrogance and so a confident person has um, great resolve and great belief in their ability that they can they can prepare like learn prepare and execute to a high level that they, they walk into the flight going, this is going to work, and if, it, and if something goes wrong, I've prepared exactly what I'm going to do. So you, you actually lean forward into the flight, ready to go and confident to do it. Whereas an arrogant person has the same confidence, but they won't listen to advice. So it's making sure you are confident to go and do the job, but you're always listening for advice, and you're always striving to improve, which is debriefing and taking Opinions, you know, anyone can, I can, I can learn stuff from a four-year-old going, hey, that looked silly when you did that. And I go, that's a good point, I'm gonna learn from that. Whereas an arrogant person will go, go away, you don't know, you're not as good as me, why would I even bother listening to you? And that's arrogance. Arrogance can get you killed, and arrogance stifles improvement. So be confident, but always debrief and listen to anybody who's got some advice for you. Wow, great advice from Matt Hall. Matt, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate uh, your wisdom and sharing some of your knowledge with us. Uh, great to have Matt Hall here, thank you so much. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you guys for watching that video. Uh, please remember if you enjoy our content, uh, like and subscribe and we'll keep it coming. And as always, safe flying.